I think we're going to just start, um, given that we have quite a tight uh, time schedule. Um, good morning to everybody. Uh, a really warm welcome in the morning from the United Kingdom. Of course, wherever you are in the world, it could be a very different time zone, but it's a very warm welcome to you, um, whatever. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you um, all here um, to this event, which is What is Quality Perspectives from Around the World in celebration of QAA's 25th anniversary th this year. So some people were talking earlier and some people were saying, my goodness, is it only 25? Um, but it is 25 years um, this year. My name is Alistair Delaney. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of QAA and I'll be chairing today's event. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by what is clearly a very expert panel of speakers representing networks of quality agencies from all around the world. And I'd like to begin by just introducing my esteemed colleagues to you. We have Professor Nadia Badrawi, who is the president of the Arab Network for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, or ANCOHE. We have Professor Dr. Zhangxing Zhang, who is the president of the Asia Pacific Quality Network, APQN. We have Cynthia Jackson Hammond, who is the president of Council for Higher Education and Accreditation, which is CHIA. We've got Douglas Blackstock, who is the president of the European Association of for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, otherwise known as ENQA. And we have Anna Prades, who is the Treasurer and Executive Committee Member of the International Network for Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education, or otherwise known, thankfully, as INCOHE. Collaboration with our international counterparts is at the heart of everything we do in QAE and has been throughout our 25-year history. By working together, I know that we can meet future opportunities and share challenges, and we can support the delivery of higher, of quality, sorry, higher education for our students wherever they study. QAA's international team continues to engage with partners in more than 28 countries, and that's working not just to maintain, but to enhance and reinforce both the quality and integrity of the UK higher education sector and its reputation in the international sphere. And we could not have made it to this point, our 25th anniversary, without the support and collaboration um, of our partners, both within the UK and worldwide. It's through collaborative partnership with global quality agencies and higher education bodies that we've been able to facilitate institutional partnerships and develop shared practice in areas of mutual interest, such as academic integrity and transnational education, topics which I expect you will hear more on throughout this event. We're now planning to strengthen our capacity to tackle these issues and work with partners across the globe to find solutions to the challenges that we collectively face in the delivery of high quality higher education. And for us, academic quality is a term that refers to how and how well higher education providers manage teaching and learning opportunities to help students progress and succeed, whilst also meeting the legitimate expectations of students, employers, governments and society in general. It's a place that we explore expectations, particularly of such diverse audiences, but where we open ourselves to the risk, of course, of ambiguity or confusion. In celebration of our 25th anniversary this year, we have facilitated conversations that explore quality from a range of perspectives. The word quality and all its ambiguous glory is practical and philosophical in equal measure, depending entirely on the context and perspective of the individual provider or institution. We began our quarter of a century series in March by publishing an article through the Higher Education Policy Institute that explored what quality means in UK higher education, recognizing the varying approaches to quality enhancement and quality assurance across the four parts of the UK. And in this report, we defined quality as existing on a continuum, ranging from quality control at one end through quality assurance and into quality enhancement at the other. Quality control, well, that's predominantly about accountability and measurement of stated outcomes, whilst quality assurance examines how well the underpinning processes work to support quality. And that's all the time, not just when an exter external agency is having a look. The article understands control as the kind of retrospective post-production aspect of quality. It focuses on the output itself, not how it was achieved. Quality assurance, meanwhile, acts prospectively to provide confidence that there are systems and processes in place which ensure that quality will be achieved, not purely by happenstance, but as a planned and predictable event. But then we come to quality enhancement, which is about going beyond the baseline. It's about working co-creatively with students, constantly rethinking about what we thought we knew. 
a collective endeavour towards improving processes and outputs, both incrementally, but also transformationally. And this aspect of quality recognises the opportunity for improvement, even where the relevant sector expectations are already being met. Enhancement is thus not merely about checking what we are doing that in higher education is effective, but about committing to a continuous cycle of improvement. And it's important to understand that student engagement is a central component of effective quality enhancement for us. We cannot enhance the student experience without engaging them in partnership and understanding what quality education looks like from a student's point of view. Through today's events, we will explore what quality means from the perspective of global higher education communities. Each member of the panel will have just, a sh just short of 10 minutes to introduce the organization they are representing and present their own personal perspective. And after all of the panelists have had the opportunity to share their thoughts, we will have around 20 to 30 minutes for a panel discussion in which we would welcome your questions and contributions. Please do post your questions in the chat so that we can cover them at the end. So, Without further ado, I would now like to invite the first colleague on our absolutely wonderful panel to start us off. So a really warm welcome to Professor Dr. Zhangxin Zhang, who's president of the Asia Pacific Quality Network. Professor Zhang. Good morning, afternoon and evening. Dear Moore, nice to meet you. I'm Jason Zhang, APQ president, also professor of Yunnan University, China. Congratulations to KOE's 25th anniversary. Thank you for inviting me to join your session. Today, on behalf of APQ, I'm happy to share some ideas on college with you. And give me one second to open my uh, presentation. Okay, I hope it's okay. It is okay now. Okay, my topic is what is quality? Perspective from the Asia Pacific Quality Network. And here uh, are the photos of APQ board directors. And first of all, I'd like to introduce APQM. APQM is the largest and the most influential uh, quality assurance, uh, non-government, non-profit international network in this region. And in Asia Pacific region, we have 53 countries and territories covering half of the world's population. And as for APQM, today we have 250 members from 45 countries and territories. We also have observers from Europe, such as QE in UK and uh, an advertisement. Welcome you to attend 2022 APQM Academic Conference to be held on November 24 and 27 in Singapore. Please go to visit the APQM website. And uh, Epicurean history development is 90 years old, as I mentioned before. Next year is the 20th anniversary. And in 2003, it is initial development. It is funded in 2003. And from 2005 to 2012, it is a basic construction development. We have website and uh, constitution Epicureans. And from 12 to uh, 16 is a CFO for sustainable development. Here, we uh, didn't get any funding from World Bank. And uh, fortunately for us, from 16 to 22, it is a sustainable development. And I'd like to see it's a third quality generation. And I'm happy to be the president during these six periods. And next year will be the beautiful future for us. And we are looking forward another um, step forward. Okay, let us talk about what is quality. And uh, quality is like love. When there is love, we feel it. And know what we're talking about. 
But when we try to give a definition of love, we're left standing empty-handed. Just like famous philosophy Robert Persky said, there's no general consensus on the concept of quality. An objective definition of quality doesn't exist because quality is just like beauty. It is in the eyes of the beholder, just like love is in the eyes of the lovers. And different stakeholders have different understanding of quality. Quality education, from the perspective of the academic staff, they think excellence is quality. But from the students, they think added value. And from the students and employers, they look forward to the client satisfaction. For accreditators, they think threshold is the most important. But for the external assessors, should be fitness for purpose. For the taxpayers and the governments, value for money. You should give what I pay for you. So in our mind, quality is doing the right thing in the right way with right persons in the right place. What is epically multiple quality idea for high education? And as we all know, we have different stakeholders and inside we have teachers, students, administrators in higher education institutions. We have higher education authorities. But outside, outside universities, we have all kinds of employers, alumni and society, student parents, experts, assessors, accreditators, so I like to say it is 360 degree quality circle. And so educating multiple quality idea is demonstrated by change process of APQ members. At the beginning of establishment 2003, we have only three category of members, four member, intermediate member and associate member, in fact, Three members are one category because all of them are from QAAs. But later, we think quality should be made of internal and external QA. So we added a new member category. It is institutional member. It is from all kinds of higher education institutions. So which covered a large part of, uh, of our members. And in 2012, we think of individual opinion also very valuable. We added another category, individual members. What is quality assurance? We think there are key, three key elements. Number one, internal QA, that is most, most important for quality assurance. And then the second part is external QA, just like QA, we come to university to promote the quality. And the third might be third party, mental accreditations. Uh, all of the purpose is improve quality. And QA is a process of establishing stakeholders' confidence that the provision, including input, process, and outcomes fulfill the expectations up to the threshold minimum requirements. And QA is all impressed the term covering all policies, all processes, and all actions through which university quality is maintained and enhanced. Now, what is APQA quality model for higher education? We, at the beginning of the higher education, we made a mission statement, goals and aims and expected outcomes. And during the uh, process, input, administration, policy, staff, students, funding facilities. And uh, during the process, study program, research programs, community service, and the output is graduates, scientific production,
in the, uh, services to the whole society. And at last, after four years of education, we must realize the mission, achieve the goals, achieve the out outcomes, which we established at the first beginning. And at last, we should reach the satisfaction of all kinds of stakeholders. And here is an example of Asia Pacific Quality Labor, APQL, for internationalization. And in this one, we reviewed the symbiosis international university in India. In this uh, international uh, APQL labor, we have five criteria, 12 indicators, and uh, 35 observation uh, points. Our purpose is to establish quality standardization of QA system of internationalization, promote students and teachers' mobility, and et cetera. And the last, Epicurean Quality continued, uh, Continuous PIRI, uh, QI Improver Circle, we should first planning and then action improvement, uh, implement. And then we will review and at last improve the quality of the whole education. And it is the uh, idea in our mind. And uh, uh, I really hope all of us, the QA persons, both inside of university, of outside university, we join hands and work together for the beautiful dream of our good, excellent quality uh, of education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. I, I'm very taken by your idea that quality um, is love in 360 degrees. Uh, I'm sure that will <laughs> that will go down very well with uh, all the institutions that all of us work it with uh, around the world. So thank you very much indeed. Um, thank for you. That. Um, we will move on now. Um, if you're able to to stop sharing your screen, um, yes. To our next speaker. Um, who is Anna Prades, who is the Treasurer and Executive Committee Member of Inquihe. Um, very warm welcome to you, Anna, and we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. Thank you. Let's share my presentation. I hope you are seeing it okay with the full screen. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, wait a little moment. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. We are delighted to have the opportunity to participate in this debate and congratulations to QAA. Uh, let me very briefly present myself. I'm Head of Internationalization in ACU Catalunya, which is a regional quality assurance agency in Spain, uh, where I've been working for more than 20 days, 20 years, sorry. <laughs> And today I speak here on behalf of Inquahi Network, which I have the pleasure of serving as board member since last October. Let me very quickly share you a few facts of Inquahi. Inquahi was the first quality assurance network uh, and it was established in 1991 with eight members. And right now it has more than 320 members around the world. Our mission is to promote and advance excellence in tertiary education through the support of an active international community of quality assurance providers. Uh, we have a huge diversity of members from organizations responsible for quality of tertiary education providers to quality en enhancement cells from higher education institutions themselves or organizations or individuals with interest in quality assurance. Among our milestones, I would like to highlight that in 2003, we published the first edition of Principles of Good Practice in Quality Assurance. And these guidelines have been reviewed in 2006 and in 2016, and now we have transformed them using a modular approach into international standards and guidelines, which aim to be a tool not only to support enhancement of quality assurance, but to support external quality assurance providers, uh, trust, credibility, and therefore recognition. Obviously, internationalization is in our DNA, and it shows from our board composition to the hosting of our events, last one in Mexico, next one in Kazakhstan. And this brings me to this slide, which is going to be useful to illustrate a main point of my presentation, which is diversity. Uh, as our global report shows, there are around 345 um, external quality assurance bodies globally, and 60% of them are a part of an international network. 
Uh, I'm going to the question at hand, defining quality, what this does um, diversity mean? Well, each and every of these dots um, is embedded in, in one system of higher education with different structures, with different ideologies or different visions, uh, dominant views of, uh, of the world. And each system has different challenges. And what is more, these challenges evolve through time. So it's not the same a system where in the last 10 years, 1,000 higher education private providers have popped out that another one that in the same period of time has exactly a handful of higher education institutions and they are the same, or a third system where they have decided that their higher education system is going to be exclusively delivered by international higher education providers. So does this mean that the question of quality internationally is pointless? On the contrary, I'm going to defend that each and every of these points should be able to answer the question of what is quality in their system, because each of them do have guidelines and procedures. And in those guidelines and procedures, they crystallize their vision of quality. So practitioners of quality assurance do need to identify uh, in, in this place of this spectrum that Alistair mentioned before, from consul to enhancement, they are. They do need to know whose lenses of quality they are applying, which voices are more heard than others, whether it's the legal voice, the discipline voice, the academic voice, the student, the business economic perspective, the labor market voice, etc. They do need to know what problems those guidelines are addressing and whether they are addressing them in a manner that is going to be fruitful or whether they are going to generate undesirable outcomes, window dressing, defensive institutions, and so on. So from this point of view, what QAA is doing today is absolutely commendable because they are making explicit their own vision of quality. The one vision of quality they is, that is translated in their guidelines and procedures. So in Quaje answer to what is quality internationally is, there are multiple answers of, to what is quality. And this answer should be dynamic. It should evolve with the system or the profession in the case of the professional accrediting bodies. But what we have to ensure is that this definition, which has, the, which has implications in our role, procedures, and guidelines, must be relevant. And for relevant, we mean that this it must be suitable to the priorities of our system and of our stakeholders. So the implication is that professionalization of those involved in quality assurance is key. And this is why it's one of the pillars of Inquahi strategy. I would also like to add that defining quality in itself, it's, it's necessary, but it's important to differentiate between the role of internal quality assurance and the role of external quality assurance. And to make this point, I'm going to use a very simplistic example, but very straightforward which is that say that I build planes in my backyard, okay? And I may even build very good planes, exceptional planes, whatever they are. And I, I may even have an internal quality assurance systems and each year I make in better planes in my backyard, but they don't fly. So my quality is independent from external quality assurance, right? And really nobody cares if they are externally quality sure but say that I receive public money for building my planes, or say that I want to make them fly in the, my country, right? Should they trust my word for the quality of my planes, or do we need external quality assurance? And what conditions must be met by this external quality assurance provider in order to be trustable itself, right? And this is where regional and international standards come into place. And finally, let's imagine that I decide that my planes want to fly in another country, and this country asks for different requirements. Maybe they have technical requirements because they have more turbulences. Maybe they want my planes painted in blue because they want to boost their blue ink um, industry. Or maybe they want more sustainable planes. These are very three different kinds of requirements. And external quality assurance providers should be able to talk uh, um, um, between them. Honestly, and should, uh, you know, uh, an external network such as the ones we represent today 
do fulfill a vital role in fostering communication, professionalization, trust and collaboration among systems and in turn facilitating mobility of professionals and higher education graduates between systems. Uh, but external quality insurance is not only useful to signal quality, external quality insurance bodies can also be important and very efficient levers of change for the education system. And which brings me to my final point. Are there any international trends that affect all of us? And um, from Inquaje, we believe that UNESCO's roadmap for reinventing higher education presented last May in Barcelona has serious implications for the practice of quality assurance. In 2020, 235 million students were enrolled in higher education, more than du the double the of students enrolled in 2000. However, despite the, spectac the spectacular expansion occurring in many parts of the planet, several disparities remain. And higher education provision is an activity that with the potential to foster equity and equal distribution of opportunities. We do believe that quality students can and must play a role to support progress along this roadmap towards more innovative, flexible, and inclusive solutions to support the global agenda. We do need to explore how to ensure quality and flexible learning pathways, how to ensure that digitalization of teaching and learning does not compromise quality, ensure quality assurance of cross-border higher education, as well as how to safeguard core values of quality. Ultimately, we believe that in order to not only be seen as relevant signaling quality, which is one of our functions, but to truly be relevant, we do need to invest time in staff development in truly understanding the innovation and diversity happening in higher education. So we are developing standards and practices that actually help our tertiary education system. So as our president Debader says, we have to be students of quality in diverse provisions, before we can become stewards of them. And with this, I finish and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. That's really thought provoking. I like the idea of being that you said at the very end, we need to be students first before we can be stewards. And um, that is you know, something I think we all should take into account. A number of your questions we will pick up um, at the panel discussion around about things like the different um, styles and approaches and the changes that are taking place uh, in the delivery of higher education. And I'd be really interested in the panel's views um, on that. So for the moment, we will move on though to Professor Nadia Badrawi, who is president of Anquahi, which is the Asian network. Um, welcome, Nadia. Really pleasure to have you here and really interested to hear what you have to say. Hello, everyone. And I would like to thank you very much for uh, for being uh, uh, for inviting me to this important uh, uh, actually uh, where it, it went again. Huh? Just a minute. Share the screen. OK, is it OK, is the screen? But you need to turn it onto the slideshow and then it will be fine. Okay. There we it's, go. Perfect. Okay. okay. So um, I'm really thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to all, to meet all my colleagues actually in the networks in quality assurance and it's for a special occasion of uh, the 25th anniversary of, uh, of QE. Uh, so I will talk a little bit on the impact. Maybe I will move a little bit from the quality and uh, the definition and whatsoever. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact of QAA since it's your 25th anniversary on the quality assurance in Egypt in for Ankahi. And I will talk more to the challenges of quality assurance in this region. So, I want to say that uh, from 2002 to 2006, we were very in Egypt, collaborating very much with QAA in England through the British Council. And there are two legends, British legends in Egypt called Arthur Brown and Bob Scoffel. I really would like to know where they are now. Uh, they are the two people, they were assigned from QAA to Egypt to start the quality assurance in 2002. And they did a lots of capacity building. And I remember very well the first site visit for an institution and programmatic uh, program was in, under the observation of Arthur, Bob and Arthur. Everyone in Egypt, if you talk to anyone in Egypt, they will, uh, they will tell you where is Bob and Arthur. So the first meeting actually for uh, 
uh, to establish the Arab network started in 2004 in Egypt, and this was organized by the British Council, and they sent for us um, uh, people from uh, QA uh, with the Committee of Quality Assurance in Egypt. And we started to, to think, how can we networking together? At the same time, it is history, actually, but I think it's something important that everybody knows it. Uh, from 2005 to 2006, there was a, a, a project called GCAC project, financed by the World Bank, managed by the UNESCO, and it was to establish networks all over the world. At that time, there were only the APQM, the NCAP, and the Quahe. Um, uh, and then we started to develop network where uh, the Arab network, the African network, the Iberia, Iberian Pacific Network, the Caribbean Network came up uh, to work together. So this is historical actually, but uh, I have to, since I'm representing now Ankahi, I would say that it, uh, Ankahi, which is the Arab Network for Quality Assurance, had been established in June 2007. It's an independent, non-governmental, non-profit organization. And currently, all the, the Arab network in higher education has members from all the Arab countries in the region. Uh, some part of the region, we are in uh, 22 Arab countries in this region. Some part of the region, which is the, uh, the, the Djibouti, the Somalia, the Eritrea, Comoro Island, never, never have been in contact with us, but all the other region had been in contact with us and they are member of the Arab Network for Quality Assurance. So as I said, I'm going to talk on the challenges a little bit, just a little bit of movement. Uh, and we see the most important challenges in the quality assurance, probably in the region and probably all over the world, is the digitization. Uh, quality assurance agents in the region sh really should update it themselves to the level of the digitization of the higher education institution. Higher education institutions are going, growing fastly, less than the quality assurance agencies all over, at least in my region. And so that part of our challenge is to, to updating the standard, whether it is institutional or program standard, to reach the level of digit, digital learning. And to do that, we should have, we should design a good capacity building for the reviewers to be updated with the digital learning. At the same time, student assessment is completely different nowadays after Corona and after digitization. And we should have standard to ensure that there is a credibility uh, using digitization and student assessment. On the other hand, also, different, in, in, uh, different, different IT infrastructure in different countries, not even in different countries, it's in the same country, same government. You can find, say, in the capital, the IT structure is good, but if you go down to the rural area, you might find that it needs some more uh, work on it. Uh, the second uh, challenge is uh, within our region is the environment for proper quality assurance, actually. So th there is unstable environment in the higher education landscape everywhere in our region. There is a political and financial instability in many countries. You can find in our region very rich country and very poor country. Political turmoil is everywhere. Syria, one of the countries that was just in 2011 up to it to, to to start their quality assurance. They never started until now. The same also, uh, the new trend of uh, uh, private higher education institution, and there will be challenges in financial sustainable of sustainability of private higher education institution and its impact on the quality provision. The third one is the culture. Yes, many of the Arab countries, they have a good culture of quality assurance, but the culture of evaluation still needs to be emphasized in some countries. Also, the conception of quality as an administrative, it's a burden for higher, for higher education institution, for the educational leader. They always say it's a burden, it's too much paper, it's too much work. So we have to reinforce as a challenge the quality culture among higher education institutions 
and embedded this culture on the internal quality assurance culture to, in, in the day to day's operation. This is so clear to us, and you have to work on it. And then I will go to the regional and international organization, quality assurance organization. It's a challenge to cooperate with regional and international uh, quality assurance organization. During the time of GCAC project, we all the network were meeting regularly. I think that Inquahe is trying to do this also to meet all the network together. This is so important to be connected. And the second thing is the competition. Competition with sometimes non-recognized or authorized or regulated regional and international quality assurance agency. You can find, I find somewhere, sometimes I go somewhere, we got an international quality assurance accreditation. And when I hear the name, I don't know who it is. And then between us, the mutual recognition of quality assurance is a challenge. Uh, we we're, were trying to do this actually in the last five to six years, we could not reach a really mutual recognition for quality assurance between uh, all of us. And then come to the transnational education. If you take countries like the Gulf countries, like Egypt, say, lots of transnational education, lots of branch countries, lots of franchise. The quality of assurance of this transnational education is so important to have at least a framework. And I know that in England, there is the NAREC, there is the ACTIS, they are doing benchmark, but it's not really uh, uh, all over the place that it should be. This is an, a, a challenge for us. And then the accreditation mills, as I said before. And then there is something newly coming, the competition to attract regional and international students. Every, every uh, higher education institution are looking for international ranking. And if you look to the ranking, there are a lots of ranking. I mean, not less than five or seven ranking institution. Which one is the best? Which one should be? I mean, it's, it's all over. So we have to, it's a challenge actually between the ranking and the quality assurance agency. So getting regional and international recognition for qualification is something else to attract the regional and international student. The fifth area is the research. Many of the quality assurance agency actually, they should develop a fitness for purpose assessment for research activities inside the quality assurance, in the limit of the quality assurance agency. This needs to have a work, need to have capacity building, workshop, financing. I mean, this is something uh, I think it's very important, the research in quality assurance. Uh, sometimes when I think how many paper on quality assurance is actually uh, published, we will find that much less than the scientific uh, uh, papers for in any subspecialty. Lastly, I, I would like to say something about the quality assurance organizations themselves, the work inside. Uh, Part of the challenges is the lack of adequate tools for validation of information. The continuous alteration in the administration and leadership, you can find they turn like this. The number of local experts in quality assurance and accreditation, this is more in the Gulf area. And then the balance, you are talking uh, about uh, quality enhancement and quality accreditation and uh, quality assurance and accreditation. There should be some balance between those because part of the world, they want just to go on quality enhancement and, uh, 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 and another part, they, want, they don't want quality enhancement, they want only quality assurance and accreditation. Lastly, and again, capacity building of the staff member uh, of the quality assurance agent in the era of digitization. It needs lots of work. This is, I mean, it's a, a, a resume of what is the, the challenges in quality assurance agency. And I got the information by sending to all uh, president of quality assurance agency in the Arab region. And they sent me, they sent me their uh, idea, opinion, and I resume it in, in this presentation. But if we talk to the Ankahi itself, it has also challenges. Challenges that uh, we should develop a system, we should do a capacity building for the less developing country, 
the limited financial resources that we have, uh, how to keep contact with all the, the agency, it needs a lot of effort actually. The meet the regular meeting also since the COVID, we did not I definitely did more than one or two meetings. Uh, how to facilitate exchange of regional reviewers between us and again facing the cross-border accreditation mills. So it's again the, the population size different in every country that we have, the economic capacity is changing, the access to higher education, the, the financial sustainability. It's it's different from every country, and I believe it's also different in the Asian, it's also different in Iberia. It's the same everywhere. And lastly, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm really happy to, to share with you my, my thought and the thought of the Arab network on the challenges for quality assurance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. That was really thought provoking. Uh, a number of challenges, uh, but again, you emphasise the diversity um, uh, that you have to take account of. One thing that I, that, that struck me linking to the Inquiry presentation was where you said you you had people um, your institutions being accredited by agencies that you had never heard of, mm -hmm. and also I was taken by Inquiry as well, showing that there was three hundred and forty five quality agencies, but a much smaller number were actually a member of a network, um, which is interesting in itself and something that we may come back to um, in the questions. So thank you very much for that just now. Um, we will now move on to Douglas Blackstock, who is the president of ENQA, but also, of course, Douglas was the chief executive until very recently of QAA, so he brings that significant experience as well. Welcome, Douglas. Uh, thanks, Alistair, and I will make the vain attempt to share slides in a way that I hope uh, works for you all. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon from uh, Krakow in Poland. I'm trying, I'm now going the wrong way around, sorry. Um, uh, the beautiful city of Krakow in Poland, where I'm actually on holiday um, for another European type event, but not related to quality assurance. And uh, I should say commiserations to colleagues from England, Wales, who have been relegated in European football. And I hope that the two Irish teams don't get relegated tonight and that Scotland gets uh, promoted. But this is a, a wonderful occasion for QAA. You know, I remember in 1987, as a student being visited by your predecessors, the Council, Council for National Academic Awards, and then in the Student Union Management in 1993, being visited by another predecessor, the Higher Education Quality Council. Both of those organizations have gone, but since uh, I experienced the QAA visit for the first time in 1999, uh, you've gone from strength. The strength, but I want to talk about the European context and the broader range of the work of our association, ENCA. Um, we are, an, as familiar with other colleagues who have spoken earlier, we're an umbrella body for a, a non governmental organisation. Um, our members are agencies, not governments or anyone else, and not institutions, but only agencies. We have 56 full members in 32 countries and 52 affiliates in 30 countries. To become a full member, you have to take your own medicine. That is, every five years, you have to undergo an external scrutiny by an international panel of peers. Um, QA has your next review next year, and we look forward to the outcomes of that. Uh, we are one of the co-authors of the European Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance, and we do that in partnership with the European Students' Union, uh, the European Universities Association, Eurasia, of the Technical Institutions, Business Europe, and uh, Education Europe and other stakeholders. And of course, we uh, are also work in partnership with the register, the European Quality Assurance Register, which is a list of those agencies that it's not compulsory, but it's a list of credible agencies. And we encourage every member to go forward uh, to be on that and all of our affiliates to undergo a review. Uh, we're also co-organizers of the European Quality Assurance Forum, which we'll meet in Timisoara in Romania in November. And there's a massive gathering uh, five to 600 uh, experts from institutions and across a whole range of organizations. But this event being a discussion between regional and other networks in quality assurance is, is important. And Nadia mentioned capacity building. We've been working over the last uh, few years in developments of quality assurance in Africa through the harmonization of African quality assurance and accreditation. Nadia's home agency, NACWAI in Egypt, was part of that, and that over 50 countries involved 
in developing what is now published as the African Standards and Guidelines. Not an imposition of Europe's position, but the development of their own standards and guidelines. And also in the SHARE project, uh, fund, both of these projects funded by the European Commission uh, in the a Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which has led to the publication of, of the ASEAN Quality Assurance Framework. And indeed, later this week, I will meet with uh, the Executive Committee of our plan. Uh, and actually, what's really important, I, I attended a meeting last week with all of the government higher education experts in the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development. And, and I, 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 I thanked him for the work that was done many years ago to create the, um, uh, the guidelines on cross-border higher education by the OECD and UNESCO. But I argued that there was not, now not the time for greater imposition of new international rules, but for cross-regional collaboration between these networks to build trust and understanding to actually get the guidelines we've got implemented uh, at the moment. What I should say is that in Europe, we have the European Standards and Guidelines. It's a remarkable feat to get 49 countries, to get the ministers, and it's ministers that sign these things off, not the agencies, uh, but to get ministers of 49 countries with different cultures, different legal systems, different approaches, and different contexts to agree a common set of uh, principles. Uh, and the goal of the ESG is to contribute to the common understanding of quality assurance for learning and teaching. But the ESG are not standards for quality, nor they describe how quality assurance processes for, for, uh, should be implemented. You know, this European higher education area, an intergovernmental agreement, is characterized by, characterized by its diversity of political systems, different education systems, different traditions, and the single monolithic approach to quality and quality assurance in higher education is inappropriate. It's inevitable that some actors will look to seek to narrow the interpretation and define what agencies do, define what universities do in, in great detail. But the beauty of this is by sticking at principle levels, we can create common understanding and share experiences with colleagues in other networks around the world. Um, some thoughts on quality now. I, 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 I thought I was quite innovative until I saw Zhang Jing's lovely presentation. I, I worked for 20 years in student organisations. And what I was going to say is quality is very much like entertainment. Every student has got a view on entertainment and what should be put on for them. And all their views are different because their tastes are different, their interests are different, and some things you love and some, you, some things you hate. But there are a number of aspects of quality that I think are really, really important. Um, and the learning approach has to be student centred. You need to think about stretching students, stretching academic staff, and developing new concepts. And the world of higher education we're in, and then is changing. Does the learning environment contributes to quality, whether it's teaching or study spaces, the learning resources, the IT, the libraries? Uh, there has to be, it has to be about engagement in an academic community. The students coming with a desire to learn, but also being inspired by qualified and experienced teachers and support staff. It has to be about assessment that's fair uh, and recognises learn, learning in a fair and transparent way. There's a whole experience around the students invest time, emotion, money, the families are invested in it as well. Uh, and, and that has to have an experience that starts before students come to an application, their admission, their induction, the time on the campus, the social and wellbeing aspects and allowing them to grow as an individual. And it has to be relevant for programmes that really matter for life or for work or for society and inclusive uh, and given opportunities to contribute to the academic community. And I guess my the reason for saying all of that is my principal argument is, and I think this goes with what colleagues have said before, any measurements, any numerical measurements of quality will only be a proxy. And you need to put them together in a package for a holistic view of what you've been told that the, the students' experience of quality is. Um, and it's not doesn't come by accident. Uh, and this is there are colleagues who argue we shouldn't focus on processes. We should only focus on outcomes. Now, outcomes for students, I think, are important. But actually, you will seldom get a good outcome without a good process. And that means uh, you need to take time in an institution to plan, to organize, to design uh, the, the, the learning experience for the students. You need to regularly reflect on those experiences and what you're hearing. And there should be an element of co-creation that is, is with, with the students, 
uh, with uh, stakeholders and employers, and that's written throughout. I think there's 11 of the European standards and guidelines have references to stakeholder and student involvement in quality and quality assurance. And I think that quality is best advanced when interested students and stakeholders are collaborating and developing expectations and the sharing of effective uh, practice. And I was asked to talk about live issues for ENCA at the moment. I, I this morning would give the opening address to ENCA's working group on the quality assurance of micro credentials. There were over 300 people in that, that, that online meeting. It's a live topic. Those I see, you know, I think uh, several colleagues on this panel, and I see other names in the list, were at the UNESCO event in Barcelona. It was a big feature throughout the discussions. It's a way of democratizing higher education and widening uh, opportunities. But also the role of quality assurance agencies in protecting academic integrity. I recognize what Nadia says about fake uh, accreditation bodies. Several of them have applied to become members of ENC. Um, and, and, and I would say to, to, to well, my colleague Cynthia, uh, they quite regularly had registered offices in Delaware. Uh, and, and I called on the OECD last week for governments. Us as networks cannot take action against these bodies. Governments have got to clamp down on fake institutions, uh, fake accreditation organisations. And, and in that respect, I would congratulate QA in achieving the United Kingdom government in outlawing SMLs in, in the UK. Uh, we're really interested in innovation and quality assurance. The world of higher education is changing. Quality assurance cannot be a block. It has to evolve and move forward with the new uh, approaches to HE. And we're part of two projects. One is quality assurance fit for the future. And that's about how will the European standards and guidelines evolve with the idea we'll present findings to the next ministerial conference in Tirana and Albania in 2024, and also partner in implementation and innovation and quality assurance. And the key thing for that is I'm in QA is the project, but it's through peer learning, lots of sharing of, of experiences and, and, and colleagues uh, working together. Uh, we want to support, you know, I mentioned earlier, we've got 49 countries in the European higher education area, but there are uh, over 15 countries and regions where the agencies haven't yet met the standards of the ESG. And so we're not sitting back and leaving agencies to their own uh, their own de 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 devices. Uh, we're currently working with six agencies, uh, three of them have already committed now to go through a review, mostly in the former uh, Soviet bloc. Uh, I'm working very closely with them. And then we just launched the start of a new project working with five more agencies. And this cover covers countries like Albania, Slovakia, Montenegro, Moldova, uh, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, uh, and several uh, others. Sustainability of quality assurance, and I think there is a big debate to be had. If you add up between our regional networks in this panel, how many millions of air miles have been run up? How many, what is the contribution to the carbon impact, uh, you know, the, 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 the impact on climate from all of our travels and our work? Can we be more efficient and effective of that? But also the sustainability of agencies, because as I see it, more and more agencies are losing public funding and having to enter a competitive and commercial uh, market. Uh, I think it, it, you know, in most regions now, there is an opening up of competition. And so how sustainable are agencies? And what does that mean about their practice? I am as deeply concerned as Nadia is, and I have spoken to my colleagues about this, about uh, European agencies going overseas, going out, sorry, going outside of Europe, selling accreditation, and, and to make sure that they're absolutely ethical in the way you go about it. There's one thing to compete on your product and your offer, uh, but it's very careful, got to be very careful that you're doing things for proper reasons um, and not get involved in questionable practices. Uh, and, and, and so I think there's a really big discussion there that across the regions we can collaborate together. And then the last thing is I mentioned that we have regular external reviews of, of our own members. You know, there are three parts to the ESG, internal quality assurance of the institutions, the external quality assurance of institutions, but also the quality assurance of agencies themselves. So what are we learning from these reviews and how can this inform uh, external quality assurance uh, practice? So colleagues, that's everything I wanted to say. I hope it's in some way been informative uh, and I look forward to uh, the discussion later. But I think the last thing I would say is that I 
repeat what I said at the OECD meeting last week. We need to work on the collaboration between all of the regional networks to share, to learn, to build trust and confidence. And so thank you, QA, for giving this opportunity for us all to speak. Thank you very much, Douglas. Real good challenges for us all here um, and some real thought provoking stuff that we'll pick up hopefully in the, the discussion afterwards. We're just going to move on to our final speaker before we have that panel and, and discussion. Just before I introduce them, just to say to everyone, please, this is an amazing opportunity to have world organisations here um, together. So if you've got questions, please, could you put them in the chat so that we can make sure that we can direct your questions that you have um, to the panel members at the end. So moving on to our last speaker, Cynthia Jackson Hammond, the president of CHIA. Certainly not last, Cynthia. We're really looking forward to, to hearing your input um, and uh, uh, what your thoughts are from a CHIA perspective. Well, thank you so very much for inviting uh, the Council for Higher Education Accreditation, known as CHIA, to be a part of this discussion and to represent the only non-governmental quality assurance organization in the United States. Uh, just to level the discussion, I want to provide a little context about the role of CHIA as a recognition function and how CHIA's role differs from the US Department of Education. The work that CHIA prescribes to is in the form of de the development of standards that are attributed to the recognition of accreditors. Recognition by CHIA affirms that the standards, the structures, and practices of accrediting organizations promote ethical practices and integrity in their decision-making. It represents academic quality. It represents improvement accountability and needed flexibility and innovation in the institutions or programs that are accredited. CHIA is the result of a referendum in 1996 by colleges uh, and, uh, by college and university presidents that said that they wanted to be the responsible entity for defining quality and higher ed. On the other hand, you have the US Department of Education, the federal agency, which is tasked with establishing recognition or regulations of accreditation that's required by the law. Their oversight of quality is for the purpose of institutions' ability to receive federal funds for operations. An institution or program cannot be eligible for federal funds absent of achievement of accreditation by the Department of Education. So here in the United States, you can be CHIA accredited and a, a, a accrediting organization can be CHIA accredited and it can be uh, uh, recognized by the Department of, of Education, or it could be one or the other. CHIA recognizes approximately 65 institutional and program accreditors. I might want to say at this point that CHIA also has a think tank arm called CIQG which is CHIA International Quality Group, which provides a think tank about all of the issues associated with quality across the globe. And this year they are celebrating their 10th year and uh, we look forward to a big recognition and celebration for them at our CHIA conference in January. So how does CHIA define quality? We define quality in terms of our recognition process. The evidence of performance, performance associated with teaching, research, learning, and service, included in a very integrated way in which learning, 
practice, and discovery are fostered by the institution and programs. Academic quality includes the expectations that institutions or programs have of their students and the effort those institutions and programs accord to the promotion of student success. Student success is the ultimate goal of quality. So the traditional input matrix for assessing quality have transitioned to output levels of performance. And the quality of a higher education institution is viewed through the lens of how an institution or program provide evidence, not just saying it, but evidence that students are able to demonstrate success. Quality can be measured qualitatively or quantitatively, but using both types of data are preferred and provides a more comprehensive assessment of the quality outputs of that institution. The demand for accountability and transparency in the United States has steadily increased against the public dis discourse that questions whether or not higher education is of importance or whether or not it has value. Universities and accrediting organizations have identified evidence of student success based on student learning outcomes, student satisfaction, and Douglas, you mentioned student satisfaction with their learning experience. How is it that the student integrates and reacts and responds to those experiences? They are also assessed by performance data after college completion. And in some cases in the United States, the economic gains associated with academic disciplines. So what kind of career, what kind of job, what kind of financial gains are the results of certain academic disciplines is becoming more and more of a discussion point for deciding what quality might be. Other measures reflecting quantitative metrics include retention, course completion, students' academic satisfactory progress, and the college cohort graduation. How are cohorts completing their graduation experience within four to six years? Although CHIA has a constructed definition for academic quality for recognition purposes. I think we also see quality as an evolving paradigm that will shift and evolve as the context of higher education and public expectations evolve. Quality is and should be as viewed as an ambitious but attainable goal requiring a continuous improvement model for institutions and programs. There is no one fixed definition, but it is the result of how we view ourselves within the context of our political scope, economic scope, social development. Quality, as I said, does not come with a finite definition but it comes with a philosophy that higher education can and should always aspire to be better. The more higher education experiences human growth and development, the integration of social cultural development, global integration and economic drivers all which are evolutionary in process, the more imperative it becomes that quality be defined in broader terms and always 
with how students view themselves as being successful to meet their personal expectations and the expectations of the public. There are challenges associated with quality and certainly challenges associated with the accreditation process that helps to identify quality. Some of those challenges include, number one, and we've heard these before, the different types of alternative providers in higher education. There are many programs out there that may be considered to be fast, quick, and easy with little attention given to external quality review and accreditation. Secondly, in the self-study or accreditation process, the conflict in roles and responsibilities of accreditors. Am I looking at this institution for quality and academic integrity, or am I looking at it for the purpose of seeing whether or not they can handle their finances? A third accreditation self-study quality challenge is, again, the definition of quality. No one universal definition. And then if there's no one definition, how are those different definitions or integration of quality measured? This can become problematic, especially with the migration of students going from institution to institution, going from one nation to another nation, looking at the college experiences. And finally, there's always public scrutiny. The public is much more savvy about quality and or at least they, they would like to think that they are much more savvy about quality because quality for them is what is it that you are doing for my students? What is it that you're doing to use the resources that are provided by taxpayers. So there is a cry from institutions, from quality assurances, assurance organizations to be more accountable and to be more transparent. At the end of the day, we all are about quality for the purpose of academic integrity, academic sustainability and accountability to the students that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Really thought again, thought provoking. Um, and this idea of everyone knows what quality is from their perspective, but it's, an, it's too difficult to define in general. And it is you know, obviously very context specific. So um, really interesting. Thank you to all of the panel members for their introductory um, speeches. We've got a little bit of time and we've got some really interesting questions, um, which some of you will have read in the chat already to give you a, a head start, um, which I'm going to go, go through. So thank you to, to those who have given us a question. The first one, I think, is really important to you as representatives and presidents and, and, and others of the quality networks in the regions. And that is, why is mutual recognition of quality such a challenge for your respective networks? Who Actually, would like to go first? I, I, will, I will go through this because I have experience and we work together with every network actually and in every quality assurance in the region to come up with a mutual recognition of, of I mean, if I accredit a, a school in Egypt, it should be accredited in Jordan or whatsoever. Um, Always there is a friction here. Uh, the quality assurance agency would like to be involved in the process to accept the accreditation of the other region. And I had this experience actually when we were doing a benchmark for transnational education in one of the British school that have franchise and uh, uh, I think it was joint degree or uh, dual degree in one of the Egyptian university. And to ensure that this is going to go through and both uh, quality assurance would accept this, we involve the quality assurance agency in Egypt in the process of accreditation and benchmarking of this university with the QAE, I think, or 
there was some some organization from Britain. So this is going on through ups and downs for the last five or six years. And by the way, the ANCAHI, which is the Arab network, aged 15 years. So we have a long process actually to do that, but we didn't actually succeed in taking a real acceptance and sign up of mutual recognition between the quality assurance agents in the, in the region. So I would like to ask you, in ENCA, I think there is, there is something going through very well in this, right, Douglas? Yeah, yeah if I may, look, one of the uh, key benefits we have in the, the European higher education area is the Lisbon Convention on Recognition. And then every country has a, a, what's called an e or an ARIC, which is Recogn you know, recognition and in, in information centres. And, and so that has facilitated. I wouldn't say that the UK is in, in a great position at the moment, and, and I'm sure that I know there's colleagues from uh, the, the, the recognition centre on here. Um, the exit from the EU has led, particularly around professional qualifications, has led to a new act, act and a lot of discussion. So the Lisbon Convention has been a huge success. But um, in some agencies in Europe, the age, the quality agency, and the NARIC are the same body, um, although they don't necessarily communicate internally all the time. In other countries, the agency and the NARIC collaborate on projects, and QA and and, and, and the UK uh, NARIC have done that. Uh, I, I, but in other countries, they don't speak to each other. They have no physical connection at all. Uh, if you were to take um, Anna's here from the, the Spanish system, where you have eleven regions and uh, uh, autonomous communities, and the national systems, one thing. But in Germany, you have a competitive market for quality assurance of, I think, nine or 10 agencies in competition. So it's not necessarily in anybody's interest to, to, to have a dialogue. So, so that's one thing. But we also have the Addis Ababa Convention uh, for Africa. We have the Tokyo Convention on Recognition being signed. And I can't remember if it's actually been signed yet, the Buenos Aires Convention. But uh, what I should say is that thanks to the, the, the UK as one of the earliest signatories in the global convention and recognition. Uh, and, and those of us who were in Barcelona know that that was a big, big push from UNESCO to get signatories. I think we're probably close to 30 countries now. And I certainly take the view that that global convention on recognition is really important. But what we have to understand in that is that there are 11 times in that convention quality assurance is mentioned. And six times it's mentioned as credible quality assurance. So we as agencies and regional networks need to explore that, have this dialogue and start to think, how do we build trust and confidence? But the issue in terms of any blocks on recognition, I'm afraid, are not down to the agencies necessarily. Because actually, I know from my experiences, agencies do, with, you know, never mind with the regional networks, but agencies to agencies are speaking to each other. The problem always is, is often is the national government and the national government's reg re regulations and it is legal system, because actually they're accountable in their own country, not accountable to other countries. So so, so, so we recently had a seminar in Paris uh, organized by the French agency, Hacheres, and it was a presentation on the implementation of the European approach to joint degrees. And mm -hmm. the colleague said, the European approach is beautiful. It's really well written, dead easy to understand, but it's extremely difficult to implement because our expectations of the qualifications of academic staff in Croatia is different from the ones in France. The legal description of a degree in Croatia is different from the legal description in France. So there are big barriers to, to be overcome in that respect. And, and I... You've hit mute, I think, Douglas. It starts with each agency having to have conversations with its ministries and governments for them to start thinking about how do they facilitate the treaties that they've signed up to. Um, so that's a long answer, but I would commend QA yeah. for the work you've been been doing in in, in building trust and confidence with other agencies, and, uh, and and we should all encourage our members to to build cooperative arrangements and 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 and, and, and alliances with our, our, our other countries. Uh, can I uh, reply? There are, in my idea, two uh, examples. Shia. Shia is recognizing the quality assurance agency. So there is mutual recognition because there is a body who recognizes this. The second uh, example that I have, the World Federation of Medical Edu Education. It's, a, it's an organization who recognize quality assurance agency 
to accredit medical school. What I'm seeing, it's, it's going on that uh, the, the medical school all over the area, they seek uh, accreditation from a quality assurance agency that is recognized by World Federation of Medical Education. For at the end, if there is a body to recognize quality assurance agencies like SHEA, like the World Federation of Medical Education, maybe this will pave the way for the mutual recognition, in my idea. If I may, Alison, I think I think that's a really important Quite point, because right. actually there is. It's ENCA and the European, for and us, ENCA. it's ENCA yeah. and the European yes, Quality exactly. Assurance Register. Exactly. But on, on, the w, on the WFME, and, and I've met the colleagues on many, in fact, I first met them at, uh, I think, in your conference in Cairo, Nadia, and then in yeah. Cynthia's conference in Washington. Um, you know, what's put the, the requirement of agencies to sign up to WFME recognition is simply because the US government made it a condition. If you want to practice medicine yeah. in the US, you have to yeah. go through a WFME school. It's a brilliant money making exercise for WFME. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we met as we, we, we met with them as ENCA and said, look, we can show you dozens of reports of every one of our member agencies have gone through an external scrutiny and evaluation which is, I think, more credible than yours, we think you should automatically recognise them. And they said, no, they're requiring every single agency to undergo one of their refuse. It's a bureaucratic um, uh, inconvenience is one thing, but it's an unnecessary uh, process. And then similarly, they can agree that with the other regional networks. So I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I, I think WFA do a really valuable job and a valuable role, but I think they could, be more open to dialogue with the regional networks. I agree with you 100%. I agree with you 100%. I think the idea of the recognition is the most important. Whether this idea of recognition come from the networks, come from uh, uh, an organization like CHIA, an organization like the NCA one, this is the idea, but not the process. I agree with you 100% about World Federation of Medicare. Right, I'm going to have to move us on. Apologies, and, okay. uh, to give, and to give others a chance um, to come in and answer some other questions. We will never get through all these questions now, so yeah, I will yeah, do yeah. my best. Uh, apologies to to those who have given this them. Um, again, in that in that area of of international recognition, um, you'll see a question around: Is it possible to have greater international alignment around the accreditation of virtual and blended programs and qualifications? Because some countries see online and face to face as potential equivalent; others don't even recognise that as a a quality education experience and um, although some of them did of course do it during COVID what's your thoughts around uh, online and blended how do we get an, an international idea about what quality looks like there and hopefully some of our other colleagues will maybe come in at this point uh, I think uh, I think the idea of an international quality platform is you know has been there for a while uh, there has been quite a few publications about international quality. And it's very essential considering the way that our borders have become a lot less uh, uh, difficult to cross and institutions uh, or um, agencies are certainly going across borders to provide accreditation in other countries. And I think that those kinds of conversations are very, very critical. And there are organizations like what we did at UNESCO and what we uh, have with Enquire and what we have with CHIA and all these other major organizations is a platform for us to come together to talk about the guiding principles that we all can agree upon for quality assurance. Um, and so from those discussions come a platform that says, we all at the baseline will be focusing on this as quality. It's not ever supposed to be that this is the be in and be all, but to have a baseline for which we all can engage and hold ourselves accountable for through our quality uh, uh, assurance uh, agency is a powerful and much, much necessary step forward. Uh, I, I wanted yeah. to, yeah, I, I'd like to add that in Inquahe, we have been working with these international standards and guidelines. And uh, I pointed out earlier that we are using a modular approach. 
And, and this modular approach, we, we part from baseline standards who are mandatory for all of us, all of those who want to apply, which is a voluntary process uh, at all, right? Absolutely. But this baseline standard would be mandatory, which are more or less what we are doing in everywhere else. You know, what, what makes us trustable as quality assurance agencies, independency, autonomy, expertise, uh, and so on, right? But then we have this smaller approach for those agencies that want to assess uh, cross-border quality assurance, short learning programs and micro-credentials, and also online uh, blended programs. Because uh, when we were uh, carrying out uh, these uh, stakeholder consultations that we carried out in the seven regions of the world, uh, one the, of the needs that uh, arose from this uh, stakeholder consultation was just this subject how to assess the blended programs, especially for those institutions that were face-to-face -face institutions and now they are offering everything in, in blended, uh, blended learning uh, modality, right? So that's our kind of contribution to this area. I, I also want to, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Janjin, could she come in first? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, to my, uh, AP, uh, to APQ, I think it's a greater uh, international alignment around the creation of virtue and the blended program qualification is very, very key, uh, crucial, especially for uh, the COVID disruption. And uh, APQ in the past, we are trying to do the international cooperation. And just as I mentioned before, we have, have APQL for internationalization. And uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 last year, on May 31st, APQL uh, released the APQL standard for online teaching. And the standard are uh, on the APQ website. The main purpose is we're trying to promote the international recognition of not only in this region, but all over the world. So, but uh, I think it's a long way to go as uh, I would like to see, just like uh, now APK just uh, 90 years old for such, uh, for a person, it's just a young, young man, not very adult, but I think, in the future, we have uh, many experience and uh, we can just uh, follow Chia, Nkwahe, uh, Anki, and uh, we can dialogue on the same platform. I think I'm very hopeful for such kind of uh, suggesting a proposal. Thank you. Thank you. So it is possible, um, uh, which yes. is great through cooperation. I'm going to move us on to another question, um, trying to squeeze as many in as we can. Um, one of the speakers mentioned earlier that um, research in quality assurance is nowhere near as extensive as research in other areas of or, or other disciplines. So we've got a question. How can an individual research scholar be motivated to take up research in areas such as quality assurance? That has stunned the panel. How can so you make this interesting? <laughs> so, uh, you know, what I, I didn't hear all of your question. Was it that they wanted to know how to uh, motivate re uh, researchers. researchers to take up the interest? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question because, you, you, we, you know, we get into our networks and we think we are the only ones who are interested in this in this subject matter? I I, I can say you on a personal a personal note. Chia has a fellows program. Chia CIQG has a fellows program, and right now we have uh, an international member uh, who is a fellow who's spending eight weeks with us, and this would be our our actually our eighth I think our eighth fellow that we have had in the last three years. They spend two months with us learning about quality assurance, learning about the international scope, uh, understanding accreditation and its purpose. And from that experience, they develop their research topics for their dissertations or their master's thesis. And then they 
have an opportunity to go out and explore different areas of, 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 of accreditation and quality. For an expiring researcher, ask the key questions. That's where you began with any research. Why is this institution considered to be an institution of promise? Why is this institution considered high quality? And from that, you would be surprised at how many questions are derived from that conversation. And to have those kinds of conversations with the, with the compliance officer or the assessment coordinator at those institutions. Interesting development in Chia, though. That's really good to hear. We love um, our um, fellows. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they love you too. Um, just uh, we'll move on to another question again, just trying to squeeze as many. And this is probably the last one we're going to be able to get to. Um, and it's a, it's a challenging one. Why is being accredited internationally, why does that carry no weight whatsoever with the ranking agencies? And is there any thought about uh, discussing with the ranking agencies about how international accreditation would help them to be recognised? Um, I'm happy to start. Because <laughs> the rankings are um, uh, the nonsense, really, in some respects. Uh, some of them are more credible than others, and I think so I know I know Phil Beatty really well. He runs THE, and 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 they've tried really hard to make it broader. Um, and, and to my mind, some of them are getting more credible. The problem is it's an algorithm developed by commercial companies that want to sell rankings, um, and encourage institutions to join them. Uh, and, and I think the difference would be if quality assurance reports were to feature in the rankings, they would say you need to come up with simpler judgments that rate institutions with gold stars or in, in levels of quality um, that, that in a way that's easy for them to pick up. So if we give institutions a star rating, for example, that may play again. Um, but other than that, they are, I'm not sure all of them publish their particular algorithms or how they come to their judgments. Um, you know, I went to a, 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 a conference organized by one of the rankings agency and they launched a new ranking and lo and behold, um, the early adopters of that rankings were all the ones who won, if you like, the prize. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure we'd be able to persuade them unless we adjusted what we do to fit their purposes rather than the purposes of our national governments or our institutions. Thanks, um, Any other I, thoughts? Yes, uh, Nadia, of course. Actually, the wording itself of international accreditation, what does it mean? I mean, it's a, a accrediting agency in some countries, which is you call it the developed, non-developed. Uh, I mean, the word itself needs a definition. And uh, uh, part of it, uh, as Douglas was saying about uh, uh, something, about ranking, about everything, it's money. I mean, if you go to anywhere, all the higher education institution wants the ranking. The ranking, uh, uh, organization is it's a money talk actually and i i'm seeing nowadays in the arab region they want to do an arab ranking and the time higher education they are doing an arab ranking it's a, it's a process that maybe we should have more uh, uh, um, uh, discussion about it maybe in this year a big conference which is involve everybody 400 people I think they come from all over the world can we can discuss this a little bit to come up with um, a, a, a proper definition of what is that mean and what is that mean and come out of the uh, financial part of it I mean maybe we should do that something uh, uh, sincere I mean it should be um, more awareness uh, on this uh, on this part thank you i'm afraid we have run out of time i mean we have so many questions <laughs> so little time to answer them um so i apologize to everyone including the panel what we will offer to do is we will collate the questions together and if i could ask the 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 support of the panel if you would mind if we could send the questions to you and you could Ooh. perhaps give us an, an answer from your perspective and we will share them with everyone that's here and obviously people have already asked in the chat about sharing the the presentations which we'll of course do um with the permission of the presenters 
Um, can I thank you all um, for, on the panel for giving us your time and your thoughts, your ideas, um, and some really challenging um, ideas they were too for everyone who's been listening. And can I thank everybody for uh, listening in around the world. Um, I hope that you got something from that as I did. So thank you very much. Have a good time for the rest of your day. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and thank congratulations. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope we can meet face to face to celebrate your <laughs> happy birthday. Uh, absolutely, Alistair, congratulations. And I spoke at a conference in, of the Central East European agencies last week and I highlighted uh, QA as an outstanding example of an agency that had decided to put its independence and its, you know, its principles of its independence above other factors in, in recent decisions. and. Uh, you know, fantastic uh, leadership that you you have yourself and Vicky and your board. Thank you. Real pleasure to see you all. Have a lovely time, uh, and I will hope we'll see you again in person at some other events. Goodbye. See you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.